Alexis, give me the 776 thesis on investing in AI. Well, look, there's a lot of hype right now. I've been investing in the space for over a decade, back when it was just narrow AI companies, you know, seeding companies like Athelis and Cruz. So this is really now a big breakthrough. Generalized AI is a giant buzzword, but there is some real special truth there. And we're looking for companies that are using this technology to enhance the user experience in outsized ways. It really is as simple as that. Uh, and we're seeing it across the portfolio from AI produced dubbing, like deep tune to uh, sports media right. management companies like Scoreplay. It's, it's not about just the buzzword, it's about how are you improving users' lives using this technology effortlessly. Well, when I was looking through the portfolio, you know, the examples of Scoreplay and DeepTune, you, you kind of split it maybe into a tool, an AI tool, which we call generative AI, mm -hmm. and then an existing technology platform, which is kind of improved or added to using AI. You, you know, explain to us why Scoreplay and DeepTune fit those two kind of categories and why you'd invested in them. For sure. Well, you know, as the owner of two professional sports teams, I know how important right. media management is. And this process of actually capturing the clips, the photos of everything happening on the pitch or in the stands, and then, you know, getting those out to the athletes, to social media, to your media partners, that is a ton of work. And software should automatically be able to seamlessly make all that happen way more effectively. But now you layer in AI and you have something that now does it 10 times faster, whether it's identifying, you know, this is Sydney LaRue, this is her kicking a goal, this is the DoorDash uh, logo visible. And so all of that stuff can now be automated away. And so smaller teams can get far more done. And it's not reinventing a whole new technology. It's leveling up existing software that already has deep relationships with customers. And so there are gonna be these types of companies that have strong moats and lock-in that are gonna win. And you know, there's gonna be big winners in this space as well. ChatGPT is probably the most famous one, uh, which I'm not an investor in, though I really should have bugged Sam about that a lot earlier. Uh, you know, I use it to tell bedtime stories with my daughter. Uh, and so you're seeing this very generalized, you know, approach from an LLM like OpenAI that's going to solve a lot of problems for a lot of people, and then much more specific approaches that are solving, at least right now, strong business needs and, you know, offering it like any other subscription as a service business. Uh, just real quick, if mm -hmm. you do bug Sam Altman, I reported last week that there's a tender offer underway, right, and there's pretty Big, big blocks of shares on the secondaries market yes. that you know value open AI 86, 90 billion, mm. more than 100 billion in some of the prospectus that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Is that a way for you to get in or do you just, you just stay away from open AI given its late growth stage? I am such an early investor. I wanna be there at the point of inception all the way to maybe the series A. That's, that's when we like leading and writing that first check. Uh, at this stage, I still think there is value, but it's not, you know, it's above my pay grade. I, uh, <laughs> I, enjoy, I enjoy being super early and right, um, but, uh, you know, it's still, it, it's going to continue to surprise us, I think, what these technologies are able to do. And, and yes, there is a ton of hype, but I do think the sky is the limit. And I've, I've known Sam since he did Y Combinator together back in 2005. And one thing he has never lacked is ambition. And so if, if there's anyone who can turn this into, you know, what all the, the sort of hype is about, it would be him. Uh, Alexis, that, that takes me to our first question from our Bloomberg technology oh. audience. You know, I, I said on social media you were coming on the show. And this is an interesting one that was posted on X. How do we score the efficiency and impact of artificial intelligence versus the impact of human intelligence? Mm. And this follower is talking about the impact that, like, Sir Isaac Newton and oh. Albert Einstein oh. had on mankind over a series of decades. How do we equate the impact that AI's had in, in a much shorter space of time? Wow, this is, this is like the, like who is the goat debate uh, in sports. I, I think this is, <laughs> we are very much still living in this moment and so it's hard. It's like we're still evaluating <laughs> open AI and, and generalized AI sort of mid season. Uh, but I don't think it would be unreasonable to say that this is on that order of magnitude. Um, and, and what we're gonna see here, I really hope, you know, I, I am a tech optimist by default. I really do hope will help improve so many lives. You know, we, a, a good example, um, you know, while starting Reddit, my mother was diagnosed with a, a terminal brain cancer. And, you know, it, it, so many Americans are faced with life altering consequences um, where modern medicine really can't do very much. 
And we've had this amazing kismet where, you know, in the last couple of years, the cost of sequencing an entire human genome has now plummeted to a few hundred dollars. It is now trivial to get basically the mountain of data that are the building blocks of each and every one of us. And with a ton of data, you have the chance to, to make some great progress and solutions, but you need the horsepower to analyze it and learn from it. And, and what kismet that now we have these also breakthroughs in AI, I really believe the next 10 years in medicine alone should be able to help us far better understand what, what ails us, uh, be able to create some tremendous breakthroughs that I hope will save many, many lives. And you know, these are the things where if we can look back on this technology being a, a very significant and also very positive force in this world, I think medicine is gonna be a big part of it. Um, that Nucleus is another company I've invested in along those same lines. I, I really, really believe we will understand things 10 years from now, thanks to these AI breakthroughs about our own bodies, that will make what we consider today modern medicine actually look fairly basic uh, or, 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 or pretty elementary by comparison. Alexis, you called yourself a, a tech optimist, and, mm -hmm. and you were an early investor in, in some companies that have IPO'd recently, right? We had mm -hmm. this kind of short, fantastical three-week period in September, and it kind of curtailed off, but mm -hmm. how did you read that IPO window in terms of what's to come? Well, you know, I was on another business network, uh, and they asked me the same question, or at least along the lines of, you know, is this, does this mean it's open season on IPOs? And I was very cautious in my answer, and I'll, I'll continue to be cautious here. You know, this economy still has to find its footing. There's still a lot of, of work to be done to get confidence back in the markets. But what is so telling is, you know, having invested, I was a partner at Y Combinator during the housing crisis, having invested through rough economic times, you know, all of this tightness I really believe will actually help create some of the best companies because the companies getting started right now are the ones being forged in fire. They're the ones who are not taking the next round of funding for granted. They're the ones who know they have to solve real problems. The, those are the companies that are going to be really special. And so I, I can't help but feel like even though I think it's still going to it's still going to be a little chilly here uh, in the markets um, that, that in the long run, this is going to be seen as a, I think a very fruitful time for new companies to get started. And you know, the IPO markets will open when they open. And again, I, the, the joy of being an early stage investor is I don't have to dwell too much on the state of public markets. It, it makes M&A kind of interesting as well. You know, a lesson learned on Bloomberg Technology this year is that, especially in AI, right, that you can found a company uh, that makes it kind of right to be acquired by a larger enterprise or SaaS company. Um, we've had some mega deals as well, like Microsoft Activision. Mm -hmm. You know, as a venture capitalist, how do you feel about M&A as an exit opportunity, but the, the market broadly? Yeah, it's going to be a, I think for a lot of companies, it will be a good landing. I think there are some great opportunistic uh, acquisitions that are bound to happen. Loom. Uh, was recently acquired for nearly a billion dollars. You know, that's a company I, so I'm not an investor in it. I cannot live without it. And, and it was a great outcome for the founders, for the early employees, for, you know, early investors. And I know those things uh, I, maybe don't get as much fanfare as an IPO, but I think there are some really healthy M&As of great products and great companies that are going to get bought that are going to end up being good investments, at least for the earlier stage investors. And, and there'll be some other M&As that are basically soft landings for companies that you know, never found product market fit or never quite found enough of it. Um, so it is a good time to have cash and a good time to be able to pick up some strong technologies and some strong teams, but uh, obviously not, not the outcome that um, most investors are dreaming of. When we, when we, make, when we write the check, we're, we're hoping for that IPO. Let, let's throw the kitchen sink of you, at you of sort of global technology markets while sure. we have you. And Great. And talk about Bitcoin. Yes, you know, Bitcoin, we're back. Interesting. <laughs> okay, well, are we back? You know, explain I, that that answer to me. I say it glibly. I mean, I, I look. I have, as you you referenced, I seeded Coinbase in 2012. So I have been in crypto for over a decade. I have invested through every single winter. None of them phase me. Um, they're all healthy uh, because they sort of clear out the tourists and the grifters um, in, in every sector, in every industry. And, and I think here we're seeing a response to, my guess, a, a sort of broader macro and global uncertainty. And what's wild is I know for, for some viewers, it may seem a little surprising that people would find safety in a volatile cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. But the fact that it is truly 
uh, decentralized and, and the fact that it is backed by conviction. You know, to me, Bitcoin has never felt really all that different from gold. Um, you know, if you explained to me that gold was a really important part of human culture, I'd understand it. As an Armenian, I, I know, I, I for whatever reason just love, love gold. Um, <laughs> we, ha we have a cultural affinity for this shiny piece of metal, uh, the shiny rock. And, and it's been built over years and years and years. And there are plenty of investors who won't touch it because they feel like it's not a, a great asset. Um, but there's a whole heck of a lot of people who have a strong cultural affinity for it. And I think Bitcoin is in a similar camp. Um, maybe it's a different generation. Maybe it's more sort of technology oriented folks. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm here, I'm investing in asteroid mining companies. And one thing I'm right. certain of is we're never gonna find a bunch of new Bitcoin on an asteroid. Uh, there's a bunch of precious metals we will end up finding. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a kind of asset that requires um, a, a sort of conviction in it as a store of value. And for a whole heck of a lot of people, there has been, at least as of yesterday, uh, another flight to it. But, you know, look, I, I invest with the long term horizon. That's one of the nice things about this job is I don't have to worry about markets day to day or hour to hour. Um, I make every investment with at least a 10 year time horizon. And so I've been holding quite a bit of Bitcoin, quite a bit of ETH. Um, as a result, um, but again, not, not investment advice or anything, just uh, my mindset's been, been very long term on this. But there's Alexis, the, the investor, and then there's Alexis, the, the co-founder and mm -hmm. an entrepreneur. And there is an interest in, in Reddit and, and how you feel about it. One of the audience we uh, questions we got was from StockTwits, actually. Ah, and, yes. and what they want to know from you is if there is something interesting being discussed within a specific subreddit mm -hmm. or community on that platform, is it the duty of Reddit to make that discoverable, to amplify it so that it, if it's interesting, it can reach a broader audience, which based mm -hmm. on the mechanics of how Reddit mm -hmm. works was quite an interesting question. Well, OK, so I obviously left very publicly three years ago. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm really commenting here as an outsider. I one of the big shifts every social media company has has made in the last call it three or four years has been getting a smarter front page algorithm. You know, folks over at X have, have very aggressively tried to open source exactly how that works. Folks over at TikTok are, you know, anything but transparent with how that works. Um, but everyone has the same end game, which is how do we make sure the content that our users see is what they want to see? And, you know, the, the guiding metrics on that are ultimately around engagement. And so to answer that question, I do think almost all platforms engage in some version of this. Interesting though is a tricky word, right? Because interestingness is truly in the eyes of the beholder. And, and I think one thing that's been very clear is that every social media platform would like to be absolved of the responsibility of determining importance. Uh, one of the reasons these, these companies, I mean, the, the, one of the founding principles of Reddit that I scrawled on a, on a poster that I put up around Cambridge was this idea that we would be creating a front page of the internet that would be decided by users, not a, a small group of editors. And you know, there's two sides to that for sure. The, one of the big advantages is the fact that it is an accurate representation of what people are most interested in. Uh, the downside is it's not always the things that the editors or the folks in charge feel are the most important things. And so we're in the middle of uh, a tremendous moment here where I think we will see, I hope, we'll see the collective consciousness of us uh, now adapting to a world where real-time information is now so global and unfettered. Um, any one of us at any time can get a, a glimpse into a world that is you know, sort of exactly tailored to get a reaction out of us, uh, which brings out both, both the best and the worst in us. And I actually think my hope is the way this plays out is in another year or two, slow news will make a comeback. <laughs> I, my, my personal plea too, as a, as, a, as a person who wants to be well informed, is, is that we can get back to a world where there is a real premium paid on institutions that want to do the work to basically say, look, we're going we're gonna to figure out what the heck is happening here, synthesize it, do the research, and then inform. Um, because trying to keep up with the daily cacophony on social, no one will ever win. Uh, no single institution can keep up with the real-time speed of user-generated content. And it's important for thoughtful voices to actually sit through and say, okay, what's real, what isn't, how do we best inform uh, folks, and how do we build a brand around that? Now, I, 
I'm not pandering here. I feel Bloomberg does a pretty good job of that, actually. Um, but it's hard because you're also still trying to fill, you know, 24-7 television space. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I do think, I hope, uh, a kind of slow news gets a renaissance here because I think we're at peak UGC and, and we just can't, we can't keep up. Yeah, well, we want Bloomberg Technology to be the global home of technology news, mm -hmm. information from, from what is such a broad topic. Look, Alexis, we, we talked about Alexis, the investor, the founder, that there's also the philanthropic focus that you have. You're in New York City uh, for Robin Hood. Yes. Could you explain to us your, your relationship with that organization and why New York City families are important to you? Of course. Well, I, I was very fortunate to be born here in New York at St. Vincent's Hospital. Uh, I was a product of Fort Greene, Brooklyn. And, you know, I was very lucky. Both my parents, um, you know, were able to, to give me opportunities. And I, I feel very, very grateful for that chance that I got. Uh, and I had an amazing great aunt Vera, who was a, a public school teacher her entire career. Didn't have any kids, um, but I was her, essentially her, her kid. And, uh, and all the time she spent taking care of me, looking after me, I, I know was, was important because, you know, while both my parents worked. And so early child care was something I, I got to take for granted, frankly. And, um, you know, I got together with the folks at Robin Hood, got to know Paul Tudor Jones, the amazing executive team there. And uh, a couple of years ago said, I want to do something that can be a way to give back to this city uh, and be a way to ensure that this is an opportunity afforded to every New Yorker, especially the most vulnerable. So, uh, you know, early childhood development is so, so, so crucial, uh, providing platforms for care and support for the, the most vulnerable New Yorkers is so, so, so critical. And uh, so I, and then along with the, the mayor's office, uh, uh, the Bezos Family Foundation, you know, so I, I put forward a $25 million uh, gift to, to the city. Um, and to build uh, out some great childcare initiatives. And, you know, I've, I've only gotten more and more impressed with Robin Hood as I've spent more time with them, been privileged enough to be on the board now. And so here we are in town for a big event, uh, the, the annual Robin Hood uh, Investors Conference. And uh, I'll be doing some fun AI demos, no surprise. I'll also have a surprise guest, a uh, pretty important person in the AI world who I may have referenced earlier in this interview. And, uh, and we'll be uh, sharing the, the, the frontline stories of where this is all headed. And, you know, I want so much uh, for my legacy that my two daughters now will know about me to, to not be about Reddit. And that's, that's not to say I'm not, not proud of what we built there, um, but it's about the work that I'm doing now. And it's about the fact that I want them to see me doing my absolute best work and doing so in a way that aligns with my values and in a way that they can be proud of. And like I said, this is the greatest city on earth. Um, there's a lot of work to do here, and I know Robin Hood's you know, one of the absolute best organizations getting monies into the hands of folks that are doing the, the good work to improve and, and taking a very data-driven approach to it, which you, you know I love.